Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast, New Books in Economic and Business History. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure to be with Ian Morris. Ian is professor of classics here at Stanford, and he's the author of a recently published book called Geography is Destiny, Britain and the World, and listen to this, a 10,000-year history. Um, I'm very happy to have you here, Ian. How are you? Okay, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. No, I was looking forward to this. You're one of my favorite authors, to be honest. And it's uh, I'm very happy that we have the chance to talk about this book specifically, although I'm going to ask you about many of the ideas that you've thrown there <clears throat> to the public opinion, which I think are, are, are super interesting. But so before that, I would like to hear a bit about you as a person, as a scholar. Tell us a bit about where you're from, how did you end up becoming a scholar? You're an archaeologist, right? That's your, yeah, I guess, although I, I want to talk a bit about that, your identity as a scholar, and I don't know how you made an interesting transition there to what probably is a larger type of intellectual. But uh, but first, tell us, how did you end up becoming a state, an archaeologist? I don't know if you're aware, but for the normal person in the street, an archaeologist is almost a medical, a mythical figure. So, yeah, what was that path? Well, I, I didn't start off wanting to be an archaeologist. Uh, first thing I wanted to be was an astronaut, which I just I really, really wanted to be an astronaut. And I grew up in the English Midlands, was born in 1960. And so, you know, when I was a little kid, it was the time of the Apollo space project and everything. This, this is so exciting. And then someone pointed out to me that Britain did not have a manned space program. And then this was like this real problem for my career plan as an astronaut. And so I was about 10 years old at this point and rather stuck with what I was going to do with my life. And my parents took my sister and me um, to see a film. And before the main film ran, they had like, you know, shorts um, opening featured uh, supporting show for the film. And the, the short feature was based on a book by a guy named Eric von Daneke. Back in the late 1960s, huge name. He sold something like 68 million books. Uh, uh, Eric Van Daniken called um, As Chariots of the Gods. And it was based on this book he'd written, which basically said that astronauts had come to Earth in the distant past and all the great monuments of the Maya and the Inca and Stonehenge and all these things, they were all built by astronauts. And um, the early pharaohs and the great kings of the Near East, all astronauts. I just thought this was fantastic. And uh, combining that with my, my recent blow about Britain not having a manned space program, you thought, you know, obvious answer, I become an archaeologist. I go out there and I, I dig up all the astronauts and so on. And there, there were a number of um, sort of setbacks to my career plans and several other things I wanted to try to do. I really wanted to be a professional footballer for a while, but I was just terrible at that. Um, but then I sort of gradually drifted back um, into this field. I, uh, as a teenager, I would go off on archaeological digs on the weekends with local museums. They take volunteers to go off on these digs. And, and that was kind of cool. I had a lot of fun. And I went off to university at 18. Uh, majored in, in Britain, you had to choose a major when you were 18, when you left high school. And so I went off to major in archaeology, but without much serious thought at that point of making it a career. But then while I was an undergraduate, I just thought, you know, this stuff this is great. I just really like this stuff. And so just, I mean, like a lot of people, I suppose, drifted into the career. Although when I drifted into it, certainly I, I didn't envisage kind of where I was going to come out to the other end. It's fascinating. I, I never thought that the story was going to evolve in that way, that there was going to be a real connection between being an astronaut and being an archaeologist. But apparently it is. And, you know, but that's an idea that it's coming out there now. It's probably part of the conspiracy theories, but like I, a bunch of documentaries out there that would tell you the same story still nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, probably many of the you serious know, archaeologists of the future are going to come from that. No? You, you, you're right about the conspiracy theories as well. I will sometimes get cornered by um, you know, highly educated, very serious people who will say to me things like, you know, I know about you lots, you archaeologists. I know all about you. You are all in league with the Pope. 
to cover up the evidence that we, and somebody has actually said this to me, it's a barbecue at my house, you're working with the Pope to cover up the evidence that we have actually found Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, and it's now in the Vatican, and you people are all involved in this cover-up, and it's like, you know, what do you say to that? <laughs> it's a strange world. Again, like, archaeologists are mythical figures for normal people. Um, and so we were talking a couple of weeks ago. I, I went to one of the seminars you gave at the archaeology uh, center here. And I was asking you a bit, like, about the profession of being an archaeologist. And you were telling me about how concrete it is on one side of the work, right? You're literally working on a tiny plot of land for probably months. And then you're connecting that with like gigantic stories about where do we come from and, and how society works. But I think your career has probably taken that to the extreme, which is that you're really writing about books that try to understand the uh, history from a very... Uh, I don't know, comprehensive way, I would say, that are probably closer to um, disciplines like history or even uh, economics. So what was, like, when did that, I don't, I don't know if I want to use the word transition, although I know the archaeologists love that word, right? <laughs> yes, um, we do. <laughs> but how did you move from someone that you used to work in uh, the Aegean and, let's say, ancient uh, world in, in, in the Mediterranean. How did you move from there to talk about, well, Great Britain or about the tensions between the West and, and, and the East? How was that? And did you perceive any uh, tension with, the, I guess, the conventional archaeologist community? Did anyone tell you when you were starting? Probably no one. Or I don't know. Actually, I would like to know if like there's some tension still there. But someone ever told you, like, dude, I don't know, this is not really what we do. Uh, <laughs> tell me a bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I started off, and when I first went into archaeology, I assumed I was going to work on the archaeology of Britain, because I was you know, in Britain, and that was what the great majority of archaeologists at British universities did. Um, but I was, I was not a very good student to start off with. My first year in college, I, you know, I should have taken a year off and grown up a little bit. So I, I had a really good time, but I wasn't working very hard. And um, at the end of the first year, we had these exams you had to take and pass. And I managed to pass them all. But the ones in the British archaeology, I just didn't do very well. The fields I did best in were the classical fields, because I'd studied some ancient history and Greek and Latin in school. So I knew a certain amount about this before I wasted my first year. And so then after taking these exams, I thought, you know, I'm going to gravitate toward the Greek stuff because that's what I've done best at so far. So maybe if I do that, I won't flunk out of college and it'll all be fine. And so I start off doing the Greek stuff and I really, really like it. And it's just so much fun. And you know, if you're going to do field archaeology, you're going to go out there and spend weeks and weeks working uh, on a site. You may as well do it in a really beautiful place where the weather is absolutely fantastic. So I loved the Greek archaeology and became fascinated with the sort of problems we're dealing with. And, um, you know, like a lot of students, though, I didn't initially think very much about the larger intellectual framework of my field. And it sort of never occurred to me to ask myself, well, why do we have all these people doing ancient Greek history, ancient Greek archaeology in Western universities? Um, because you're relative to, say, say, if I'd gotten obsessively interested in Polish archaeology or um, the archaeology of Java or something, there's very, very few specialists of who are doing these sorts of fields. There's relatively a lot doing the Greek world. And it wasn't until I was you know, some way into my career, had my first faculty job, that I started learning more about the history of the field and realized the thing was with the Greek and Roman studies that, um, that they play this major part in uh, they've played this huge part in people's definition of what the Western world is. That like up till about the 17th century, most Europeans felt that they were under siege but from Islam. The Turks were about to take Vienna. The Turks were going to overrun Europe. How do we survive against the Turkish menace? And then it's like over the next hundred years, they have this big shock. They discover, oh, you know, the Turks are not about to overrun Paris and London. In fact, we, the West Europeans, are in the process of taking over the whole world. How did that happen? This big new question comes on the table. How did we be, get into this position of 
like taking over the whole world. And there's a lot of arguments, but the answer that turns out to be most popular is that Western Europeans have inherited this unique cultural legacy from the ancient Greeks. It's you know, we, we are Christian, we are European, but those aren't the important things. The important thing is we're the descendants of the Greeks. And so because of this, one of the most important things you can do as an academic is study ancient Greece and Rome. And you will like connect to the wisdom of these places. And if you learn ancient Greek better than the Greeks themselves spoke it, you can kind of bring their wisdom into the modern world and help perfect Europe. And in the 18th century, a lot of really prominent people are very explicitly saying this. And they're saying things like, you know, the Greeks step outside the circle of humanity. They are more than mortal. There's something godlike about the Greeks. And actually, I was just chatting with one of my colleagues, I'm an Austrian, and he was telling me that... Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, one in eight university professors in Germany studied Greece or Rome. And that's out of all fields combined, you know, engineering, everything, one in eight is a classicist. So it became this, you know, it's not that now, obviously, but it became this enormous industry, all these resources devoted to it. And yet, by the time I got into the field, very few specialists on Greece or Rome would think of coming out in public saying, oh, yes, the Greeks and Romans invented um, you know, everything there is to know that's important about the world comes from Greece and Rome. You just don't need to know about any other fields. You would be considered an arch reactionary if you said that. And so it's like the profession no longer believes that. And yet we still take it for granted we should have all these resources. And surely this is a problem. This is something we should be giving serious thought to. And so I just say, you know, I really, I at least have to work out for myself how I feel about this issue. And this was what pushed me into doing comparative work on Eastern and Western history. Because, you know, there's this old argument that the Greeks create the West. The West is better than the rest because of the ancient Greeks. And yet, and this is like the beginning of the 2000s, I'm starting to worry a lot about this. And yet you look around the world and we see, you know, Japan has had this explosive economic takeoff since the 70s. China is now going through the same kind of thing. Taiwan. Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, all these places. If it's true that the West is just better than the rest, and this is a long-term locked-in phenomenon going all the way back to ancient Greece, well, how is all this stuff happening? If that's the case, surely there's got to be something else going on. So this pushed me into a serious comparative history, saying, well, how can we compare the long-term history of the East and West and decide you know, has one had the advantage going back thousands of years? Has it been back and forth? Has Was it, in fact, the East that normally had the advantage? Is the Western dominance, is this locked in since the beginning of time? Or is this just some sort of accident that's happened in recent time? So trying to figure that out, this was what pushed me down the path toward you know, opening everything up, looking at the whole world, looking at tens of thousands of years. Let, let me try to connect some of the things that you mentioned with your with your latest book, because they're, they seem to be very salient in your um, in your larger work, right? Which is, on the one hand, this interest for, but I don't know if it's the right word to use, but the idea of identity and its historical roots. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the motivation on current events, right? And this book is interesting because you are in a certain way, departing from a very junctural event as Brexit, let's say, and you're kind of trying to understand it, looking very deeply in the past, right? So mm -hmm. in a certain way, you're building the idea that there are these profound roots to the attitudes of uh, people in Britain towards Europe, right? Could you say a bit more about that? Like, what's a bit the story you're trying to tell us there? Yeah, yeah. Well, the uh, yeah, the, this latest book, Geography is Destiny, that came out um, in the summer of 2022. Um, yeah, some of the ideas of this go back to a book I wrote that came out in 2010 called Why the West Rules for Now. And that was the, the book coming out of you know, what I was just saying, like the comparison of Eastern and Western history, trying to understand um, has one 
region of the world been more developed than the rest of the world since time immemorial? Or is this just some kind of recent development? And um, the conclusion I came to in Why the West Rules for Now uh, was that if you looked at enough of history, look at many, many thousands of years, that you ought to be able to identify long-term patterns and how things have played out in the past. You ought to be able to explain these long-term patterns. And you also ought to be able to ask yourself, well, is there reason to think that the long-term patterns going back thousands of years, is there reason to think these are going to continue into the future? Or is there some reason to think that something is going to derail those trends and history will go off in a different direction? And whichever answer we come up with, can these trends tell us something about where the world is likely to go over the next 50, 100 years? And so um, this was the this way I, the sort of questions that I felt had been forced on me by trying to understand um, whether there was a long-term Western domination of the world. And the conclusions I came to in that book, um, Why the West Rules for Now, was that the most important factor really had been geography. The most important factor in history had been geography and driving how history developed. But the outcomes have been very complicated and messy because while geography drives history, history also determines what geography means. And so as um, you know, geography drives how a society develops, it captures more energy, becomes more organized, more sophisticated. And as it does those things, it then modifies what the geography means for it. And so you know, a place like, say, the United States of America, um, a thousand years ago, if it had been possible to create a USA in the North in North America, it wouldn't have actually mattered all that much because there was nothing anybody could do about the fact that you have direct frontage onto the two great oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific, which I, I would say these are the most important things about American geography today. That wouldn't have mattered because there's nothing you can do with the Atlantic or Pacific because you've only got like skin boats to paddle around in. Um, once you can cross those oceans, though, the geography begins to change its meanings. And so this, I think, has been the long-term story. And I'd written a series of books um, kind of scaling up from the details to try to explain the really long-term outcomes and um, talk about what the distant past told us about the present and, and where the world might go next. But all the time, I had a lot of fun writing these books, but all the time while I was writing them, there's like this little voice in the back of my head, what I call this a professional historian voice, which kept saying, well, this is all very well, and you like doing this work, but history is actually made by human beings, people making decisions and doing things. So... Um, if you are right that there are these vast forces operating across millennia, then you ought to be able to show that these vast forces help us understand very, very specific and detailed things that people actually do on the ground. And I kept thinking, you know, I sh there's nothing to gain by just going on writing these very big picture books. What I need to do is show that you can like turn the telescope around, scale back down to the details and take something really concrete and specific that happens and show how looking at it in the long term perspective helps you understand why it happened the way that it did. And I think about, well, OK, I need to write a book like this. Um, what should, what would be a really good case study? And originally I was thinking something about the Greek world, because this is what I'm supposed to know something about, is the Greek world. And maybe something showing how long-term understanding of the meanings of geography helps you understand how the Greeks took all the euros and lost them down the back of the couch in 2009 and set up this great crisis. And that might be kind of a good book to write. But then June of 2016, I'm thinking about this, and the British decide to vote. They, they vote to leave the European Union. And I immediately thought, ah, this is like a perfect case study for this. Because all these um, commentators rushing out, had to, trying to explain the whole of what just happened in terms of the last three years of history, going back to David Cameron's speech at Bloomberg, saying he would hold a referendum, or maybe going back to Margaret Thatcher, or maybe like the really long-term approaches would be going back all the way to Edward Heath in the 1970s, or even Winston Churchill in the late 1940s, talking about the importance of European Union. And it all saying, oh, the, yeah, this explains what's going on. And I felt absolutely confident that this was a story you can only really understand if you put it in proper long-term history, which meant going back 10,000 years. And 10,000, because that's the point at which rising sea levels cut a kind of proto-British peninsula. They cut it off from the European mainland, turn it into the British Isles. So that's the kind of scale you've got to work on. And that's why I decided to write Geography is Destiny.
That's fascinating. I'm <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you in a bit more about this notion of geography as something that it's important in the very long term, but it's not constant, right? Like one of and again, I wanna anticipate because I don't wanna deviate our conversation from where it's heading, but when I started reading the book, or when I saw the book, I thought this was gonna be a story of persistence and the conventional sort of like uh, uh, pattern that we economists seem to be interested recently, right? T trying to find the ultimate root of whatever is that we're trying to understand now. But for you, geography is something that evolves and interacts with society itself. But again, I'm gonna ask you about that more in a bit. Um, before that, I would like to know more about those particularities of the British Isles, right? What was their singularity and why was it important that apparently they were disconnected at that specific point in time mm -hmm. and never seen from the rest of, of Europe? Like what's, what's the story there and what specific geographical features are important to understand that story? Yeah, yes. Uh, well, when, when I started looking into the, the long-term British story, it seemed to me there were two geographical facts that had really driven the whole 10,000-year story. And they, they keep, they sort of dance around, it's like this delicate dance going on between them. But two facts. And one fact is a really obvious one. The British Isles are islands. Everybody knows this. There's something like 6,390 of them altogether, but only 150 are inhabited. And six or seven of these, the vast majority of the population lives in those. But the British Isles are islands. And insularity is one of the fundamental facts of British history. But then the other fundamental fact is the British Isles are very close to the European continent. They're just you know, 21 miles away at the closest point. So you've got these two forces of insularity and proximity. And basically the entire British story has been about the interplay between them and the argument over which of the two people think should be the more important. And the Brexit argument in the 2010s, of course, is entirely about this. You know, does Britain's proximity to Europe trump its insularity or not? And if you thought the proximity was the most important thing, then being part of the European Union seemed like you really the only, obviously the only sensible way to go forward. If you thought Britain's insularity trumps its proximity, then staying out of the European Union seemed an entirely sensible thing to do. And I think it's we shouldn't be surprised that the vote was so close, 52% to 48% in favour of leaving the European Union. Because this argument, it goes back all the way to the earliest written sources we've got about the British Isles. And if we're interpreting the archaeology right, it goes all the way back 10,000 years. People arguing, is it insularity? Is it proximity? Um, but it's made very complicated by the fact that what insularity and proximity mean, this keeps changing over time. So let me ask you about how much geography matter within the Isles, right? So the, I understand why you're focusing on this the tension between the insularity and proximity to, to Europe. Mm -hmm. But I don't know like for how long that matter in the sense that maybe whatever were the geographical features of, 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 Brita, of Britain probably were more important under certain technological conditions, right? And I also ask you about this because when you think about the British society nowadays, there's some, there's quite a lot of diversity. I guess it depends on like the scope that you look at it, but but still, there's some identities that are there, and probably they have also these historical origins. And so, what about that? What about the diversity within Britain, and and what were the geographical features that matter in that context? Yeah, yeah, I think those are very good points. Um, um, you know, the, the, the main argument in the book is about how uh, you know, the geography is driving the British story, but the, as the British story changes, that changes what the geography means. And it seemed to me that two big forces um, operate in this process of changing what geography means for people. And I think this is true wherever you live around the world. This is not just a British story. And one of them is technology, particularly the technology connected to communication and transport, your ability to move around for the British, particularly over water, but not just over water. So technology, one of the big forces driving what geography means. And the other one is organization. So the ability of groups to solve collective action problems, to work together, to get things done. 
And um, you know, the British story, like, like everybody's story, it's gone from a world of very simple technology and very low-level organizations to one of you know, enormously complicated technology and organization that we've got now. And as this story has unfolded, it's um, changed what Britain's geography means and changed the balance between insularity and proximity. And, and with the way that's played out on the ground, for you know, you're talking about the diversity within the British Isles, the way it's played out on the ground is that for almost all of the British story, in fact, for the eight, I say nine and a half thousand out of these 10,000 years, Britain's history, because of low level technology, low level of organization, Britain has basically been an extension of the continent. And by that, what I mean is the English Channel is like a highway, not a barrier. Anything that gets to the continental side of the English Channel, whether it's a missionaries or microbes or merchants or armies, doesn't matter. They can all cross the English Channel. Eng British Isles are an extension of Europe. And so you know, all the big inventions and breakthroughs happen way off to the south and east in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. And they kind of move across Europe, come into the British Isles because the Channel never keeps anything out for very long. Usually it sort of speeds up the transmission. And then they come into the British Isles. And the parts of the British Isles closest to the continent, the southeast, what basically what becomes England later. These are also the parts of the Isles that have the richest soils, um, the most productive climate for agriculture, and um, they're the closest for people to move back and forth to the continent. Basically, um, the, the history of what becomes England is about dealing with what comes its way from the continent. Whereas if you move north and west from England, you come into Scotland, Wales, the west country of England, then Ireland across the water. And these are places where um, you've got sort of older geological formations, thinner soils, generally cooler, wetter weather, always or nearly always have had smaller populations than England, less wealthy than England, less sophisticated, less military power. So English history is about what comes its way from the continent. But Welsh, Scots, Irish and West Country history are about what come their way from England. They, they've always been about how do we deal with the fact that we have this bigger, richer, more powerful neighbour to our south and east. And to a long part of the story, um, that doesn't matter too much because the levels of organization and technology are such that it's difficult for anyone to unify England, let alone sort of reach English power out into the north and west. But gradually that changes. And as that changes, particularly this has already begun to change by 2000 years ago when the Romans come. Increasingly, people in the north and west of the British Isles say, our great fear is this powerful England to our south and east. What can we do to constrain the English from dominating us and imposing their will upon us? And there's a lot of things they can do. One of the things they can do, though, a sort of classic uh, move that any strategist would recommend, is you kind of reach over the threat that's near you and make friends with people behind that threat. And the Chinese have this great saying, befriend the distant to combat the near. And so if you are in Scotland, it makes eminent sense to make friends in France, get people behind the English, entangle the English with concerns in France. And the French are often very happy to see this happen because what they want is to entangle the English with concerns of their north and west. And so going right back to the late Roman Empire, we see um, people in what are now Scotland, Wales, Ireland, reaching out, making alliances with people in what are now France, the Low Countries, Spain, Germany, to tie down the English, prevent them from using their power against the North and West. Um, you know, most famously, this goes back to 1295, when the Scots formed the Old Alliance with France. Um, this became for centuries, this was the sort of backbone of Scottish grand strategy, tie the English down. And it's gone through you know, all kinds of permutations since then, but it hasn't gone away. And so in 2016, you know, it's not surprising that people in England voted to leave the European Union, but people in Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to stay in the European Union. Their, their worst nightmare is to have an unconstrained England able to do whatever the English want right next door to them. Um, if they can't keep the English tied down within the European Union, then keeping themselves part of the European Union makes a great deal of sense. And so I think one of the changes that the changing meaning of geography has brought is that the United Kingdom I mean, it gets created across the 18th century into the early 19th century, gets created to solve specific geostrategic problems facing um, policymakers in London. And those problems don't exist anymore. So um, 
the United Kingdom, it's like it has outlived its usefulness. And for a long time now, policymakers in London have been trying to reconfigure the United Kingdom so that it does still have a purpose in the modern world. But um, for through all that time, your people in Scotland and Northern Ireland in particular have been saying, well, no, it doesn't. So yeah, I would not be in the least bit surprised if 30, 40, 50 years from now, the United Kingdom has ceased to exist. Ireland is unified. Scotland has become an independent country. Wales, I think, is likely to stay in a union with England. But I think um, leaving the EU, really good chance. So this is just the beginning of a sort of cascade of people recognising that the old meanings of geography uh, have now changed. I love the fact that we are able to start thinking about forecasting based on, on this very long-term um, analysis. And I'm going to ask you more about that, about the future in a bit. But um, before that, I want to point out something that I don't know if you, that I found very interesting in your like broad narrative about how geography interacted with, uh, with technology, which is that, so the, the, the main challenge here, like the fundamental issue is the distance between the Isles and Europe, right? And you have a progressive improvement in the technologies of transportation. Early on, they were pretty slow, but at some point like this skies rocket, um, skyrockets. So, but then I would expect that I thought the story was going to be, well, then e Europe is going to be closer to Britain. But what you describe is no, that's it's precisely the opposite, right? It, it actually becomes easier to isolate um, Britain because, well, there's not that technology can also be used for military purposes and, and so on. So, what I find very interesting about that is that. It describes the impact of technology in a non-very linear way. I feel that there's this probably naive approach in which we think that technology is advancing and is just addressing every single problem in a monotonous kind of direction. We are moving into a world with less frictions and so on. And so, for instance, when I like hear to the the entrepreneurs here in the Silicon Valley and they talk about social media, they say we're connecting people. Now it's easier to interact with someone in China, which is true. But at the same time, social media is making you farther away from someone in the same room, right? And what you're describing is in a certain way, the same thing, at, of course, at a larger scale. Um, and I think that's fascinating, again, if one wants to understand um, the role of history in a granular way where context matters and, and, and that's, that's important. So my question here, and I want to connect this with then this reflection about the future, what you argue at some point is that the improvement of technology led to a new objective of global powers, at least in Europe, which was to bridge or cross the Atlantic, mm -hmm. right? Um, now it seems that what matters or what technology allows us now is to cross the Pacific, right? And that's changing the interests and the power relationships and so on. So how do you think about this, right? How does East Asia come to this broad story of Britain that traditionally was just a matter of just Britain and Europe, but now probably that's not the most important part of the story. Maybe there's something more important happening on the other side of the world that might shape the 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 destiny of 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 the British people. Yeah, yeah, I think those are, are really interesting questions and problems to think about. And I think you know, the example you were giving about um, social media now, there's kind of nothing new about what's happening here. The, the details are new, but um, it's just you know, it's a latest example in a really long run story that um, you know, the development of technology is not altogether linear. And it's, we can certainly find moments when it goes goes into reverse but generally speaking in the long run yeah our technologies have been in increasingly powerful but what is really non-linear is the consequences the effects of that and so your classic example is something like the industrial revolution which 
a massive increase in the amount of energy available to humans, which has catastrophic consequences for some people in the short run. If you're a hand loom weaver in Lancashire, um, somebody making steam powered weaving machines is like, oh my God, this is the end of the world for us. We're really high paid. And now suddenly we don't have any work at all. We are starving in the streets. So obviously a very fragmentary and non-linear consequences. And I think this has been the case in this British story that I was looking at in the book. In one way, you can say that communication technology, transportation technology story is a fairly linear one. Um, you know, People are able to build boats that can cross the English Channel, sail on the open sea, certainly by 10,000 BCE, probably a lot longer before that. But they get better and better at doing this and able to travel further, further distances. And um, you can go from just being able to cross the English Channel to be able to cross the North Sea, to, you know, greater distances going on. And generally speaking, the effect of this is to speed up communication time, speed up transport, um, lower the, the costs of trade, all kinds of really, I think, very positive things. But there are thresholds in the story. And so um, in this British story, there's this threshold that right up until uh, the 16th century AD, um, your ships get better and better, but still none of them can actually close the English Channel in the sense that strategists now talk about closing the oceans to an enemy. Deny its use to somebody else who you want to keep out. You can't quarantine the British Isles because even in the 15th century, French ships can always get to the English side of the Channel and the, the other way around, the English ships to the French side. It's not till the 16th century that you cross a technological threshold that now you've got galleons that can stay at sea for months and months and you can could actually close down the English Channel if you made the decision and developed the organization um, to, to raise enough money to build enough of these ships and to pay them to stay at sea and train the sailors and all the other organizational stuff that goes along with doing this. If you decide you want to do this, now you can, but you never could before in the history of the world. And also the same technology now for the first time allows you to cross the Atlantic Ocean, which was just it was sort of possible for the Vikings, but in a very different way. Now you can fairly reliably cross the Atlantic Ocean and trade networks turning the North Atlantic into a marketing system. These become possible in a way they never were before. So real threshold has been passed. But there is this question. Um, we've changed the meanings of geography, but do we like it? Is this what we want to do? It's like um, policymakers in London realise OK, we can now close the English Channel down if we raise the money to do this. And lots of people around Britain say, uh-oh, you know, these guys can close the English Channel if they want to. But that means reaching their hands into my pocket and taking my money to pay for all these ships. And it means building up state-run institutions like a Royal Navy. And we're not comfortable with the idea of what in fact happens, that the Royal Navy becomes the biggest employer, the biggest single industry in the whole of the British Isles. That makes us a bit queasy. We don't want to pay all these taxes to make that possible. And we also don't like the idea of a government that is thinking the same way as merchants and is making merchants into really powerful people within politics and orienting state policy toward doing this. And I think you from our 21st century perspective, it's easy to think that, oh, the minute it became possible for governments in London to close the English Channel and open up the oceans and be secure behind a, a moat defensive, as Shakespeare called the English Channel, secure behind that, they can unify the whole of the British Isles into a single kingdom run from London, and they can create an empire, an intercontinental empire on which the sun never sense sets. Surely the minute they could do that, they would want to do that. But the reality was, no, I mean, a lot of people really did not want to see the country going this direction. I mean, it comes back to your point about identity earlier. This is not who we think of ourselves as being. And th these questions about what geography means, these are among the major forces that drive the breakdown of the whole British Isles into civil war in the 17th century, proportionately killed more British people than the First World War even did. Extraordinary levels of violence, really to solve this question. Is this what we want? Do we want to change the meanings of geography, move them in this direction, make Britain a place that is separate from Europe, where insularity trumps proximity? And this, you know, this is like I was saying, this has been the long term argument. It's gone on ever since the British Isles were formed. Is which of these things is going to be more important?
So let me ask you a bit about that and trying to reflect about it from a, I don't know, like a meta level, which is, I mean, the whole idea of this like long durée narratives gives the perception of some people to some uh, determinism or spirit of so, right? So history seems to be important and we can understand our present based on things that happened a long time ago. Um, but in that story, how much space is there for what you mentioned, people having agency and doing things? And what's the role of luck or uh, just idiosyncratic events? And mm-hmm. I'm thinking about, for instance, I always heard this story, and I don't know because I'm from Colombia, but the there's this narrative, which again, I'm not, I need to point out that I'm not sure how accurate it is, but many argued that the Scottish crown had to, or was pushed to an agreement with the English one to unite because of their failure in some of these colonial um, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurial endeavors that they took in Panama and and Colombia, right? And that seemed like a bit idiosyncratic or even Brexit, right? Like what would have happened? And this is maybe like, you would like to think about this thought experiment. What would have happened if Brexit wouldn't have turned positive, right? If because it, it could have happened again, like if the marginal difference was uh, well, the difference of in the in the results were rather marginal. Would that have changed the British path forever? Probably, I'm you're gonna tell me that it will not. But I would like to hear about how you think about this crucial juncture events and how history is shaped by luck and, and randomness. Yeah, well, well, since, since I sort of moved in the direction of the, the large scale, the global long term history, this is sort of emerged as kind of the central, I suppose I would call it the central philosophical question in what I do is the, the balance between the, the vast impos- impersonal forces and the, the very important persons. I mean, how much of the story is driven by the geography? How much by the individual decisions? And I guess I like to think of the, the way I see the world, not so much as determinism, as sort of constraintism, if I'm allowed to make up a new word, that uh, like... I mean, the, the example you talked about, about the Scottish colony of Darien and the uh, Panama Isthmus and how that fails and it produces this financial crisis in Scotland, um, that is really important. You're absolutely right. This is really important in the Scottish decision in 1707 to accept a union with England to form a single kingdom of Great Britain. And if it hadn't been for the Darien disaster, it's quite possible the Scots would not, the Scottish own government would not have voted to join with the English. I think it's very possible they would because this really was a big crisis within Scotland. But on the other hand, you look at this in a larger context. Um, If Scotland had had a similar colonial disaster 200 years earlier, um, the question of it impacting union with England simply wouldn't have come up. That question only comes up when the geography has changed the meanings enough that it's now possible for the British Isles, if they want to, to cut themselves off from the continent and form a single union. That begins to become possible. And so that's why the uh, failure of the colony at Darien begins to potentially have importance. And if people had in Scotland had said, no, we don't want to have a union with England. And in fact, you know, even after they'd voted, they did. The following year, they had a second vote. They had a, a re-vote, the way a lot of people wanted to do over Brexit in, in, in the 21st century. They had a re-vote. And the Scots came within one vote of cancelling the agreement with England, going off on their own. So oh, really? all these things are extremely possible. They really could have happened quite plausibly. And yet, you look at the slightly longer term and say, well, where is everything pushing them? Everything is pushing them toward union with England. Like the benefits that flow, at least for the merchant class from the union with England, are enormous. And a lot of people know this. And of course, the decision making is not just in the Scottish hands. They are under intense pressure from the English um, because this is in the middle of the Spanish, the war of the Spanish succession in the early 18th century, where the English have a lot of reason to fear that Scotland will be what they call a backdoor for the Spaniards and the continental powers to come and invade Britain, set up a base in Scotland, then come down and invade England. So the English are really pushing the Scottish to form this union to prevent this from happening. Um, It very easily could have gone the other way in the details. But I think the the longer the term 
you look at, the less plausible it becomes to think that Scotland was not going to form a union with England. Like you ask yourself, might they say they formed it in 1707? Well, is it possible that by 1717 there would still be no union? Sure, absolutely. 1727? Sure. 1807? No way. I mean, come on, that is just ridiculous to think that there would still have been no union by 1807. Everything is pushing it in that direction. And I think that the same sort of constraintism applies to just about any what if question you raise. Like, say you think about something like the American Civil War, like, say, in 1862, and the North thinks it's quite possible they're going to lose this war. And a lot of people in Europe are betting, in fact, the Confederacy will maybe not win the war, but we'll at least not lose and we'll get to a position where European powers start recognising it as a legitimate government within the South. Slavery will be preserved. And you ask you, if that had happened, would slavery still be around in the US in, say, 1870? Yes, absolutely it would. 1880? Almost certainly it would. Do you think it would still be around in 1980? I mean, that is just very, very difficult to imagine that. There's so many constraints. There's so many reasons why every country in the Western Hemisphere is moving toward the legal abolition of slavery. Um, Even if they then go out of their way to find extra legal means to preserve the functions of the old slave system. So like in the US, you get the Jim Crow system. Um, But uh, I think many of these big turning points where we say, well, it could have gone the other way if one person had done something different. Yes, it could. But it's sort of beggars belief to think it could continue going the other way generation after generation after generation. Like, could could Britain decide to rejoin the European Union? Absolutely. I mean, it, like when it left the Catholic Church in the 16th century, it rejoined the Catholic Church and then left the Catholic Church again. I think it's quite possible. Um, Britain or perhaps England, if the UK breaks up, England could rejoin the European Union. But the forces that made leaving seem like a plausible strategy in 2016, these forces have not gone away. And I think if England does rejoin the European Union, there's a very good chance it will subsequently leave it once again. So I think uh, it's... The wrong way to think about things is saying, is everything determined by geography? No, it isn't. But it imposes these real constraints on what is possible. And it's like everything that happens in history is a roll of the dice. But depending on the constraints and the pressures, the, the score you've got to get can change like some things you're scoring a six on one die that that will do it other things you've got to roll three dice and score 260 you're going to get get, uh, score 18 rather um yeah the the odds of certain things happening go up or down depending on these larger constraints i guess that's the way i would say i think about how history works I, i love the way you frame it and um I like to think that i have similar type of conversations with my students when i i teach frequently formal models um, and in those settings you have equilibria and they are stable and we focus on thinking about the equilibria right and many students are curious about well what happens are we always in the equilibrium mm-hmm. well that's not necessarily the case right but if they're stable there's a reason why they are well first there's a reason why they're in equilibrium right but also there's a reason why we tend to go to it right so the idea of the sense of stability and how shocks could impact but could still have you as a society that moves towards that equilibrium is um, it's probably the way in which I'm um, kind of rephrasing what you just mentioned in a more, much more eloquent way. But I would like to ask you one final question and now taking advantage of your confidence into the long um, history approach how do you see the future for for Britain? You already anticipated that. You think that uh, fragmentation of these entities could uh, take place, um, but I'm gonna ask you to dare to think about the world in general, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what's again? I'm gonna bring up East Asia here. Like, what do you think is gonna be the role of East Asia, China? There were these recent events in China that seem to move things in a probably unexpected direction for some or not. But anyways, the world is changing quite a bit. How do you see that it's going to evolve in the next couple of decades or so? 
Yeah, gosh, a great question. And and this is something I, I do like to speculate and think about. Uh, and um, so maybe I can sort of start small and go big uh, on this one. But the, the British issue, I think, you know, long term, what we're seeing is a reversion to the mean. That um, the British, the people who were big fans of Brexit, getting out of the European Union, I think they often had this vision of Britain, like the, the default position for the British Isles is where it was in the 18th and 19th centuries, when it bestrode the world like a colossus, extraordinary period. There's never been anything like it in history when a relatively small group of islands dominates the whole globe. And this really was an amazing period. But it was a really short period. And you know, the time you can talk about that really being true, it's really, say, 1713 to 1914. That's about it. Say 200 at the most 250 years out of a 10,000 year story. And I think what we're going to see, and I don't think leaving the EU is actually going to make that much difference to this story. Britain reverting to the mean, which is what it's been doing now since at least the 1870s, losing this um, shocking share of global trade and global finance, which is going, going kind of back to where it like should be. And it's still going to remain an important part of the world. Now, yeah, Britain today, it's a, a top 10 nation in just about any category you can think of, uh, uh, the size of its economy, um, the size of its military, or it's one of the few reasonably substantial nuclear powers, um, soft power, it's arguably uh, number one, number two in that area, Nobel Prizes is number two, only the US has more Nobel Prizes. So, so you know, it's an extraordinary part of the world in many, many ways. But it's going to, I think, increasingly go back to being something in proportion to its size <laughs> physically within in the world, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Right? You think you know, the obvious analogy that historians often use of the British Isles is the Netherlands, which has this you know, absurd influence on the world in the 17th century. Now it doesn't. And you know, are the Dutch less happy now than they were in the 17th century? I don't think so. You know, they all live 30, 40 years longer. They eat much better. They're much freer. Um, you know, uh, things have turned out pretty well for the Dutch. I think they're going to turn out pretty well for the British as well. And um, so I think that's, I would say, that's a story on the British scale. But uh, moving out from that scale globally, yeah, I mean, East Asia, and you were right to keep coming back to this. And this is an area of the world I actually come back to a lot in my books. And the conclusion I reached in Why the West Rules for Now was that um, the West is likely to continue its global domination, and the United States in particular, continue its global domination for at least another generation. It will probably do so for another two generations, but it will probably not do so for another three generations. And I think the center of global wealth and power are shifting inexorably across the Pacific toward East Asia. And uh, this, there's many, many ways this might unfold. There's you know, all kinds of reasons why China might come apart at the seams. Um, <clears throat> maybe the great Xi Jinping experiment and this idea that the Chinese dream, maybe this is all going to prove to be ridiculous and China will go through an experience rather like what Japan has gone through since the 1990s, maybe worse, who knows? All these things are perfectly possible. But I think it beggars belief to think that the forces that have propelled China up to the top of the global pyramid, basically the shrinking of the Pacific Ocean, so that it becomes just one more waterway connecting the world, it pushed China and all the Asian tigers up to the top of the pile, these forces are going to continue operating. And if China runs into the ground, then what we'll see is probably no, not going to be that different from when Japan ran into stagnation. There are a lot of other countries in Asia and East Asia and South Asia. Um, they have nowhere near begun to fulfill their economic, military, political, cultural potential. So I would say that is one thing, maybe not necessarily the next 20, 30 years, but over the next 100 years, you can, you know, you can take that to the bank. And we're going to see the shift in power toward East Asia. The great question, I think, for me, the great question is, well, how does that play out? Because that can play out in so many different ways, some of them arguably good for the whole world, some of them arguably really bad for the whole world. And the really bad ones are the easiest ones to think about. Um, it's like every period in the whole history of the world that we can document, document, when there's been a major shift in wealth and power from one region to another, it's been accompanied by massive violence. So if history is sort of set in stone, if it is a deterministic game, and we know roughly how things are going to play out, then we can be pretty confident humanity is not going to be around for very much longer. Um, because we have um, 
Well, I mean, the, the good news, actually, the good news is we no longer have enough nuclear weapons to destroy the whole human race and all other life in one day, the way we used to do. Like, if you look at the number of nuclear weapons, the number of warheads has fallen by 90% since the 1980s. Nine in 10 of the warheads that were around before the fall of the Berlin Wall no longer exist. And this is the single most amazingly good thing in human history. So, uh, I, I have a graph of the fall in the number of nuclear warheads that I use in my undergraduate lectures. And I tell students, this is the happiest graph in the world. This should make you feel so good. But of course, the downside is we still have enough that we could do World War II in an afternoon, if we felt like it. Just the release of destructive power, do World War II in an afternoon, with unforeseeable consequences for all of the radiation and other things that didn't get released in World War II. And of course, the really horrific news is that several countries are now talking about or have already begun building up their nuclear warheads again. This is really, really bad. So the, the, the bad outcome is, of course, anything that produces nuclear war. There's a lot of other bad outcomes. You know, global warming is threatening us in very, very alarming ways. But nuclear war is the bad outcome that dwarfs anything that global, the climate change can do by itself. And I know that's a very unpopular thing to say in a university, but it's true. And anyone who knows anything about nuclear weapons will tell you that. So that's the, the really bad end to the story. Uh, unless history, the way history works, has changed so much that we don't have to go down that path. And I think there are indications that maybe it has. Like, um, even as we've developed these amazingly destructive weapons, your chance of dying violently now is roughly one in 10 of what it would have been if you'd lived in the Stone Age. This is another really happy graph um, that, that we can chart. Astonishing decline in rates of violent death, you know, percentage of rates of violent death, because we've developed better ways to deal with conflict to, and to resolve our conflicts without um, using whatever is the ultimate weapon available. Like if the Romans had had nuclear weapons, you can be absolutely confident they would have used them against the Persians. Now, you know, the Russians have nuclear weapons. So far, Putin has not used them in Ukraine. And I think Ukraine is going to be one of these wars where so long as we don't blow ourselves up, oh, the whole planet over Ukraine, historians will look back at this and say this was really one of the, the great sort of test cases for whether we could solve global problems without destroying absolutely everything. Can we limit the violence there? Can we even get to a world where no ruler is going to make the decision that Vladimir Putin made to try to solve their problems by violence? And I, I guess I'm just sort of ridiculously optimistic. I think that all the signs indicate, yeah, we probably can. And if we can, then I think the outcome, the global outcome is going to be wildly different from the destroy everything outcome. That um, looking at the long term, the story of humanity has been a story of growth, extraordinary level of growth, continuous um, exponential growth of so the, the ex size of the exponents has been going up and up. And since the Industrial Revolution, it's absolutely gone through the ceiling. But the long term story of history uh, of humanity going back hundreds of thousands of years has been relentless growth. It's been uneven, it's been interrupted, but in the long run, it's been relentless. And I am confident we are going to find ways to solve our problems without resorting to nuclear weapons. Growth is going to continue accelerating. You know, we're going through a period at the moment when a lot of governments are saying we need to step back from growth, step back from multilateral institutions of all kinds, build walls around national markets. But, you know, we've been through this before. This too will pass. So I'm optimistic that growth is at such a scale now that a hundred years from now humanity is going to have transformed itself into something where all the problems we're talking about in this discussion we're having right here today these are all going to seem ridiculous they've been banished into the past of the human race we are going to turn ourselves into an entirely different kind of creature uh, than we currently are and in a way you know we've We've kind of already done this. The, in the last hundred years, what it means to be human has changed more than it did in the previous hundred thousand years. So, yeah, I am all sunny disposition, optimism, thumbs up. It's it's all going to be OK. This is fantastic. I love that you came up with that scenario. I should invite you to my class, Societal Collapse, to, so you can cheer up my students after talking oh, please to do. weeks and weeks about societies that didn't end up so well. But this was this was a fantastic conversation uh, thank, thank you, you so much that. Ian 
Um, talk to you soon. Thank you. I look forward to that. Thanks for having me on.